Space, the final frontier. That is my favorite Harry Potter quote. So we're going to talk about some space facts, and I bet they're all going to be real. A meteor could strike Earth with no warning. Uh, so, this is true, but I don't think that's what they're talking about. Because it's true in the sense of like, yeah, a small meteor, small meteors hit the Earth all the time. But considering how this is a scary and disturbing fact slideshow, they're probably talking about, you know, big old dinosaur-sized meteors. Which is pretty untrue. The chances of a massive meteor, you know, an extinction level meteor hitting Earth are incredibly low. And on top of that, there are hundreds if not thousands of people whose job is just to look for those things worldwide. You have people in every space agency whose entire job is to look for extinction level meteors and asteroids. And then there's a lot of cooperation because one of the few things people can agree about is that we should keep giant meteors from killing us all. If we do see a meteor, we actually can now divert them. Do you guys remember the DART mission? You might not if you're not a space nerd, but um... The DART mission was we sent out a little probe, smashed it into an asteroid, and saw it fin move the asteroid. And guess what? It worked. It didn't just work, it worked better than expected. As it turns out, we can change the trajectory of meteors. So yeah, chances of a meteor randomly striking Earth and causing issues... Eh, not die. This will be our night sky one day. I mean, I guess? it's So if, if this is talking about the heat death of the universe, yeah, eventually there won't be anything. But even then, it technically won't be our night sky because the Earth will be gone long before the heat death of the universe. Most things will be gone by then. So is it really a night sky if there's no sky or night? Wait a second, it can't be a night sky, because once you get to the heat death, there's no suns. You can't have night without day and- <laughs> Chunks of the Milky Way are being sucked away. I guess. Like, it's space. Things are big. You're constantly losing stuff. There are stars constantly getting, you know, getting lost to space, and then new stuff is getting sucked in. That's just kind of how gravity works. But I really, really call it chunks being lost. It's not like a big section is just, you know, floating off. This is the first one today that's just straight out wrong. A white dwarf supernova, if in the range of 50 light years, could vaporize our planet. First of all, white dwarfs don't have supernovas. White dwarfs, they can have explosions, but white dwarfs just have novas. They're the base level. A supernova is bigger than a nova, and white dwarfs are just the, you know, the base level nova. Secondly, even if it were a normal supernova, Within 50 light years, it ain't vaporizing our planet. Even within 20 light years, it isn't going to vaporize our planet. A supernova within 20 light years would probably cause mass extinctions, but it's not going to vaporize us. A supernova would only vaporize our planet if we were within probably single digit light years from it, or you know, in the same system. Otherwise, the thing we have to worry more about are a bunch of gamma and x-rays causing mass extinctions. And 50 light years isn't even the mass extinction range. It's the be concerned and maybe higher cancer rates range. Ah, yes, the Fermi paradox. Fun fact about paradoxes, they can't be proven or disproven, no matter how hard you try. There are a lot of interesting solutions to this. The personal one I subscribe to, just because I'm kind of an elitist, is I think we humans are just really early in the universe. We are the forerunners to our galaxy. Why is there no one else around? Because we're the ancients. When everyone else shows up, they're going to be finding our ruins on planets. So get to it, my future environmental storytelling skeletons. We only have so long till the aliens show up. Cosmic rays bombard our planet every day, and most of them are harmless. But some could penetrate the atmosphere and cause genetic mutation in animal species. Yeah, cosmic rays, they come through all the time and they randomly hit stuff. They can cause genetic mutations, I'm sure. The most interesting thing a cosmic ray has ever done, at least in my opinion, is that time that it hit an N64 and caused that speedrunner to teleport. I'm not even joking, here's the clip. There was a reward in everything to find a search to figure out how the guy did the glitch to teleport up there. As it turns out, the way to do the glitch is to have a cosmic ray from the birth of the universe hit your N64 at the exact time that you're doing the jump. There is a process known as galactic cannibalism, where bigger galaxies devour smaller ones. Yes! That's it. It's like, big galaxies eat small galaxies. What do you want me to tell you? The Milky Way is currently in the colliding process with Andromeda. This process will last some other billions of years. No, wait. This process will last some other billions or years. Okay. 
spelling mistake aside, we're I guess we're technically in the process of colliding, as in the Milky Way and Andromeda are heading towards each other, but the collision hasn't started. If this is what you consider the process of colliding, then, you know, when two cars are speeding towards each other, they're in the process of colliding, even if they haven't even made contact yet. Other than that, this is mostly true. Eventually, we will make contact with Andromeda, and over billions of years, the two galaxies will merge into Milkdromeda, which is a funny name. I'm not even going to read the caption on this slide, because there's so much explaining I have to do. Okay, so, there's this thing called the vacuum state. The vacuum state is like the base state of the universe. Now, there's a theory that we're in a false vacuum, and that means that the universe's default state actually isn't the correct default state, it just kind of settled in the wrong one. And so some cataclysmic event could send us into the real vacuum state. And once the real vacuum state happens, because it's better than our current one, it will spread out and the entire universe will get remade in this new state, and physics will stop working how we know them and everything will change. It's an unknowable and unprovable theory, because if it is true, we cannot know because it travels at the speed of light. When something travels at the refresh rate of the universe, you won't know about it until it hits you. And at that point, our entire physics will be redefined, so it's not like it's our problem anymore. Just go over to PBS Space Time and, like, find their Vacuum Decay playlist or whatever. There's probably, like, 30 videos on there. They're really good, but it'll hurt your brain. This caption is confusing, but basically it's talking about how cold spots in the cosmic background radiation might be uh, evidence of an early collision between our universe and a different universe. That is a theory for the cold spots, but it's highly controversial and there's very little evidence to support it. To be frank, I'm not smart enough to know if it's true or not, even if I had a paper in front of me breaking it down scientifically. But just know it's a theory, but not a very popular one among theoretical physicists. If you want this to be your head cannon for why the universe has cold spots, more power to ya. At this point, we know so little about the cold spots, it might as well be a head cannon issue. I have a second bonus video, because I've ran into this a few times, I've actually debunked it before. But I want to do it again, because I hate it so much. There are all these videos that claim that this footage right here shows the meeting of the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean. This is not true. The Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean are not like different things. We define oceans based off continents, but the Earth only really has one big universal ocean. There's not like a boundary between them. What this actually is, is the emptying point of the Yellow River into the Pacific Ocean. The Yellow River is called the Yellow River because it's full of yellow stuff, like sediment and all that. And so this is what this actually is, it's not the boundary between two oceans. It's the boundary between a very, very, very dirty river and the ocean. 